Here's what I always say to people to make them come back to church. If you want a victory church to grow, how many of y'all want our church to grow? We want it to grow, amen? I'm all about churches growing. And, and uh, our, our church, God's, God's blessed it. It's, it's done well. Uh, we, we started it with, with nothing but a Bible about 13 years ago. And we started preaching in a pizza joint that also was a heavy metal venue. Uh, I thought that was a great place to start a church because there's nothing a metal crowd likes better than a gospel preacher. And so uh, these metal bands, and they weren't Christian metal bands. They would get up and they would play. And then whenever they broke down, they broke down the, the bands and got ready for the next band. I would jump up on the stage and I would preach to a bunch of kids that weren't there to hear a preacher. They were there to hear a metal show. And uh, some of them would scream at me, you know, they, they'd scream, I hate you. And I'd be like, I hate you too, but Jesus loves you right there, kid. And they, they'd say things like, go to heck. And I'm like, yeah, you go to heaven if you'll believe on Jesus, you know. And uh, I'll tell you, you hadn't learned to preach so you preach to a heavy metal venue, but but God blessed it and the church grew. And I think the reason the church grew is because I've always had people do this before I preach. Turn to your neighbor and tell them you look like you've lost 20 pounds. Just tell them that. Huh? And that's the, even if you got to lie to them, come on, that's the after Christmas deal. And uh, I always start after Christmas, we have to do a fast in January to get back even with the Lord. And I'm, uh, I'm excited about that, but I'm pumped to be at Victory Church. This is the church that changed my life. I walked into this church in 1998 because Pastor fished me out of the pond. I was a free base meth amp addict, a meth smoker, and an alcoholic. And the touch of God and the grace of God came to my life through victory. And I got saved, healed, and delivered right here in this room. Uh, uh, I always feel nostalgic when I walk in here. I used to sit on this front row, and I tell you, I got prophesied into the ministry on this front row. I learned how to pray in this sanctuary. I learned how to serve in this church. The chairs that you're sitting in right now, I used to be the chairman of the church at Victory Church. As soon as I, I got here, I became the chairman. And uh, here's what the chairman did back in the day. We had a school here, and after every Wednesday night service, we tore all the chairs down, and before every Sunday morning service, we set them all back up. Back up. And I did it every Saturday I was the chairman of the church and I'm thankful that God taught me how to serve and how to follow him here at Victory. Come on, we ought to give God a hand clap for everything this ministry's done for so many of us. And I just saw over 480 some odd people got born again in glow. Is anybody pumped about that? I mean... I, I think that kind of becomes uh, second nature to you guys here. You've been having glow for a lot of years. You see those big numbers of people that pray to receive Christ. But what you don't understand is a lot of churches don't see one person saved or baptized a year. And this church sees as many people as some entire denominations come to know Jesus. That's a testimony to what God's doing through us here as a church body. I'm excited about it, and I believe it's only just begun. Amen. Hey, if you have a Bible on you tonight, I want you to go ahead and open it up. We're going to open it up to the book of Malachi. We're going to go to the book of Malachi, and we're going to go to chapter 3. We'll go to Malachi chapter 3, and I'm going to be the first preacher you've ever met that's preached out of Malachi chapter 3 and did not talk about the tithe. So you can rest easy right now. I'm going somewhere else, all right? Malachi chapter 3, and uh, we're going to read, it, it's verse 6 is what I'm going to read. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Malachi is the prophet. And he's bringing a, a very corrective message, if you read the book of Malachi, to the nation of Israel about some things they're doing wrong and some things he wants to see changed in their life. And, and he makes this statement through Malachi the prophet about himself. Here's what the Lord says. He says, for I am the Lord. I change not. Come on, let's say that out loud. Say, I change not. And he says, therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. The fact that the Lord does not change is good news. At the end, he says, because my character stays the same, because my nature stays the same, because who I am does not change. Because of that, the whole nation of Israel is not consumed because of their sin and their shortcomings. It's the grace of God and the mercy of God that he does not change. Now, we live in a world that changes very swiftly. How many know the world is always changing that we live in? Things that were here yesterday are no longer cool today. Things that are here today won't be cool 
tomorrow. One of my favorite people on the earth is my Grandpa Garce. Grandpa Garce is 89 years of age. He looks like me. He's a handsome devil, but about a 90-year-old version of me. Solid white hair, and uh, we're built just alike. And Grandpa Garce is a big time, probably too big of a time. We call his office the, the horse race track about uh, 40 miles from my home. We say his grandpa in his office. He loves to bet horses. He's always there. Pray for my grandpa, all right? But but uh, Grandpa Grandpa's a good time, and he's fun. He's, he's always smiling. If you like him, you'll love him. And when I look at him and I'm around him, he, he, he's just a testimony to me how much the world has changed in the last 89 or 90 years. Think about being 90 years old and looking at the world that we live in today. Think about a guy that grew up riding a horse and buggy from the farm that he was raised in to town in the morning. Think about a guy that was raised in the Great Depression. Think about a man whose father passed away when he's six, seven years of age, got shipped off to a boarding school, not a boarding school, but a farm, to work for room and board. Think about a guy that didn't learn to read as a kid, had to hustle in life to make a living. As a matter of fact, my grandfather was illiterate and retired in his 50s with assets worth millions of dollars. That's a pretty sharp guy, isn't it? Illiterate that retires with millions. And... uh, I think about everything he's seen and all the change that that went before his eyes. Now, I was riding with him one time out to Dallas. Me and my brother and my grandpa, we took him out uh, just to have a good time. We went to Cowtown in Fort Worth. We went and saw where JR uh, used to live in Dallas. My grandpa wanted to see that. Uh, It's way underwhelming. I'll just give you a heads up right now. And uh, But we went to see it. And on the way down there, this is probably... I don't know, 10, 12, 13 years ago, I had the first smartphone that had come out. This was way before the iPhone. So it was, an, uh, it was a Windows-based smartphone. Did anybody have one of those back in the day? It was Windows-based, and uh, I guess I was an early adopter. Nobody had one. So uh, it, it, it would allow you to get on the Internet, and we're driving there. We didn't have a room, and I said, well, I'll pull out my phone. And I started looking around, and he says, well, are you going to call and book us a room? I said, no, I just booked us a room. Uh, He said, what do you mean you just booked this room? I said, I booked it on my phone in the car. He turned around and he said, are you telling me you booked a room at a hotel on a device you pulled out of your pocket when your brother's driving 95 miles an hour down the road to Dallas? And he looked at me like, what is this witchcraft in your hand, son? What is this? And I could see the shock of the change on his face. Man, the world is going to change. What we're doing today is going to change. Churches change, economies change, nations change. The way we do business, it all changes. But in a world that's changing every day, I'm going to tell you there's a constant. There is something that will not change. There is an anchor that will hold. There is a rock that will remain the same. There is a word you can take to the bank. We have a God in heaven. No matter how much change goes on around us, he will never change. For he is the Lord and he changes not. Somebody ought to give God a hand clap. We ought to worship him because we can trust him and count on him to remain the same. Is anybody thankful that he doesn't change? Man, I've met some people that their attitude changes not just daily but often hourly. How many of y'all know somebody like that? Man, there's some people I know I'll run into them and it's like we're best buddies. They're, They're shaking my hand. They're hugging me. They're so glad to see me. The next time they see me, it's like I've never met them before. Nobody likes somebody like that. But you know, we got a God that remains the same. He doesn't change even though we change on him. Come on, somebody. He doesn't change even though we break our deals we've made with him at times, right? He doesn't change even though we're we're unfaithful. He remains the same. You know, the Hebrew author, he said this. He said that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the God who was and is and is to come. He will not change tomorrow. Now I'm telling you, his laws won't change, his word will not change. The Supreme Court can change what they think the laws of the land should be, but God's law will forever remain the same. So we've got a God that does not change. But I'll tell you this about our God, even though he does not change, he loves to change our lives. And he loves to change our endings. And he likes to change our story. And he likes to change what you got going on in your midst from bad to good. Now, I'm thankful that my God doesn't change, but I'm thankful that he changes my ending and he changes my story. You know, God's already so drastically changed 
my story. You're looking at a guy that was, that was totally caught up in addiction, messed up, didn't know where I was going in life. God stepped in and he changed me from the inside out. You know, the grace of God, it came to me. He started to change my ending. I'll tell you when God really started to work on my life. A lot of it was when I met Pastor David. I met his family. And, uh, you know, if you don't know the full story, Pastor David brought me here in, in the late 90s, 1998. And, and I was all caught up in the drug scene. Every friend I had was a total outlaw. And Pastor David, I was on a golf trip with him. Um, I don't know why I was on a golf trip because he's a terrible golfer, but he was there anyway. And... Uh, we were, we, were, we were playing golf, and I'm like, man, I got to do drugs to play golf with this guy. This is taking forever. And, but he, uh, he, he looked at me, and, and we got ready to, to, to leave that golf trip. And I'd really, I'd been sober. I, I ran out of crank and coke on this trip. And, and I'd sweated it out, and I'd been sober for five or six days. And he knew what I was doing already. And he, uh, he came and he said to me, Brian, the, the Spirit of the Lord spoken to me. And he told me I, I'm to offer you a chance to come back with me to Texas to get away from your outlaw friends. And it'll give you a chance to get dry. It'll give you a chance to get away from those influences. And we'll see what God does in your life. And I said, I said, yeah, I came. I think it shocked him when I said, yeah. He's like, oh, my God, now i got to deal with this kid. I thought he'd turn me down. And I came because he had a pretty daughter, and I'm no idiot, you know. So I, I came anyway. And uh, so I, I, I was here, and, and God started really working in my life. And just through a series of events, things happened. But right before I met him, here's how God really moved in my life and started to change my ending. I was, I was partying in a, in a city I'm not familiar with. I was a kid, and I'd, I'd been out partying real hard, and I, I'd had way too much to drink, and I was coming down off a bunch of crank and speed and got all messed up. And I got separated from my friends that I was with in the city, and I didn't know where I was. I didn't know where I was going. And it was middle of the night, and it was raining. It was, it was raining cats and dogs. And I was staggering down the side of the road trying to figure out where I was going. I'm like, man, I remember thinking this. I don't remember much from that night, but I remember I'm in bad trouble. And all of a sudden, somebody pulled up beside me on the side of the road. They looked up and they said, man, you look like you're in bad trouble. Can, can I help you out? And uh, I remember looking in the car and I said, you're not going to steal and sell my kidneys, are you? That's what I said to them. And they said, no. And I got in the car and they took me somewhere and they helped me. The next morning, I woke up and I got a, I got a call on a cell phone. And I looked down and it was my sister-in-law. My sister-in-law, I answered, and she said, Brian, honey, are, are you okay? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Why, why do you ask? She said, I had a dream about you last night. Said you were in a big city. You were all messed up. You were drunk. You were lost, and it was raining on you. And you were in bad trouble, and I knew it was going to be bad for you. The ending was going to be bad. And God woke me up in the middle of the night and had me pray for you, and I prayed for you all night. And, man, when she told me that, it was like God invaded my heart, my atmosphere, my space. That whenever I was out there being my own worst enemy, there was a God in heaven who still wanted to be my very best friend. Come on, he's that kind of, we have a very best friend in him, don't we? It doesn't matter what we do, he's still trying to draw us to himself. He started to change my ending in that hour and in that moment. You know, I, I think about the stories that, that, that Jesus told, and I think about the story of the prodigal son, and I don't have time to read it all tonight, but you could, you could look it up later. It's Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, and, and here's the story of the prodigal son in a nutshell, is that there was a guy that, that wanted his inheritance. He was a younger son of a father. Instead of waiting on his father to pass away and for him to get his inheritance, he goes to his father and he says, I want it all and I want it now. Doesn't that sound like the culture that we live in right now? Man, we want it all and we want it now and we don't want to wait. We want it all on speed dial. By the time I was 25, I wanted what my parents had even though, even though they'd worked till they were 65 to get it. That's the American way. And this kid goes to his dad and he says, listen, I want my inheritance and I'm going to take it now. And the dad told him it was okay even though it was one of the most dishonorable things you could do in Jewish culture. It was like going to the patriarch of your family and literally saying, I would be better off if you were dead. That's what it would be like in Jewish culture. I'd be better off if you were dead and I could live my own life because you're the patriarch. So the, the dad gave him the, the inheritance. 
The young man goes off to a faraway place. The Bible says he goes to a faraway land. If you're thinking from the Jewish context, he goes to the Gentile world where the unclean heathen and the pagans live. He takes all the money and he goes to Vegas. Gets down on the strip. He gets a room in the Bellagio. He gets all the blow he can find in Vegas. He's got a room full of hookers. And, and he, he, he spends his money, the Bible says, on riotous living. And he blows through the money partying. Has a great time. How many know whenever you got money and the party's big, you got all the friends you could ever want? Come on, somebody. But when the money's gone, so are the friends. I've got people all the time, and I'm talking to them about getting their life right, and they say, you don't know, Pastor, this guy's been my friend for so long. And what they don't understand is they don't have a friend. They have somebody that, that's attached to the same spirit that they're attached to. Whenever they dis, uh, disassociate with that spirit and that lifestyle, they won't have a common thread with that friend anymore. Some of you say, man, I've had a friend. We go back like car seats. We've been buddies all our life. And I'm telling you, if you'd get rid of that friend, your life would go further, faster than you could ever imagine. Somebody give God a hand clap if you think that's good preaching tonight. you got to get rid of those, those wrong acquaintances, those wrong friendships. And this guy, this guy blows all his money, and then he's out of luck. He doesn't have a friend. He doesn't have anything he can do in life. And he's looking, he's, he gets his job. Some of the Gentiles give him a job feeding pigs. The Bible says this Jewish boy is so hungry that he's looking at the slop that the pigs are eating. And he, he can't even have that. He, he longed to eat the slop that the pigs were eating. That's not a picture of what the world will do to you. The world has the greatest advertising on earth. But whenever you finally get what you've bought from their advertising, it always disappoints. It always comes up empty and bankrupt. The world always comes up all zeros. You always end up not getting what you think you were going to sign up for. The guy is, is so taken and torn in life, he begins to remember the father's house. And he says, listen, I can arise and I'll go back to my father's house. My father may never take me back as a son, but maybe, just maybe, if I play my cards right, my father will take me back as a servant. The servant has, has plenty to eat in my father's house. The slaves are well taken care of in my father's house, and I'll go home. You know, Jesus stood up and he told this story to a Jewish audience. Do you know that this story was not original with Jesus? It's not the first time the Jews had heard the story of the prodigal son. As a matter of fact, the prodigal son to the Jew was a lot like the story of the boy who cries wolf. How many know if I start telling you the story about the boy that cries wolf, how many of y'all know where I'm going by the time it ends? You know exactly where I'm going, don't you? And Jesus begins to tee up the crowd just like that. He says, listen, this, this boy took all the money, he blew all the money, and he comes home. And listen, in the, in the Jewish telling of the story, the boy starts walking back to the father's house. And the father is standing on top of the house looking for the son. And whenever the son comes home, he comes off of the top of the house, and he goes out to the gate that goes into the father's courtyard. And when the son walks up to the gate, he opens the gate, and he slams the gate in the son's face. And he says, you are no son of mine, you've broken the Torah, you've broken the law, you are cut off from my community. But what Jesus does whenever he tells the story is he does not tell the traditional Jewish ending. How many are thankful whenever Jesus tells the story, the father is on top of the house, and the father looks down and sees the son coming. Instead of slamming the door, he runs out the door, he runs to the son, he weeps and hugs him, embraces him, kisses him, puts a robe on his back and a ring on his finger, because we have a God that changes the ending of the story. Let's really give him a hand clap, because he has changed our Endings. Is anybody thankful that he changed your ending tonight? Anybody thankful you're not dead in your trespasses? I'm going to tell you he's a master at changing the endings. He runs out and he falls on his son's neck, literally. The father falls apart. Listen, there's some different ways our God changes the ending. He changes the ending by changing our hearts. God's a God that will touch your heart. Think about that. Jesus is talking to a Jewish audience and that Jewish audience knows that that boy's supposed to be cut off forever. As a matter of fact, whenever the father runs out in Jesus' story to see the son, really no Jewish patriarch would ever run. You didn't run if you were a Jewish patriarch. It was a shameful thing to run. You, kept, you stayed composed. And if you ran, here's something you would have to do. You would have to tie up your robe. 
You ever re- re- read where the Bible talks about when you put on the armor of God that they would gird up their, their loins? You all know what I'm talking about there? Gird it up. They, they'd have to tie up their, their skirt, or not skirt, but robe to go to war. And if you showed your legs as a Jewish male, it was a shameful thing. But this father sees the son coming, and he's willing to be shamed for his son's sake. So he ties up his robe and he shows his legs. Now, if you have legs as good looking as mine are, you're never ashamed to show them off. I'm like, yeah, I'm showing these legs, man. I'm going to use what God gave me here. It draws a crowd in. Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm a plus-size model. You know, I got to use what I got. And, uh, you know, Elaine Bryant. But but he uh, he, he ties up. He ties up. He is, is That's funny. I don't care who you are. That's funny. He, uh, he, he ties up his, his, his robe and he runs out. And there's a reason he runs out. Listen, if you brought shame to your father in a Jewish culture like that, you'd also brought shame to your entire community. And if you did something like that and you lost your money in the Gentile world, whenever you returned home to your Jewish neighborhood, the whole neighborhood would meet you outside of the neighborhood. And they had a ceremony where they would literally out you and kick you out of the neighborhood. You could never come back. The whole community would greet you with a giant pot. They would all gather together and they would say, you've broken the law, you have shamed our community. They would break that pot in front of you and they would say, now our relationship between you is as broken as this pot is, you could never come home. The father ran out to see the son to beat the crowd there where he could receive the shame and the son could go free. Jesus on the cross took our shame upon himself so we wouldn't have to be ashamed. We could go free and he would suffer in our place. He's the God that took our shame. Amen. Whenever somebody takes your shame, I'm telling you it opens up your heart. When they're willing to suffer in your place. I've had people suffer in my place. Take my rap before. I've had people that that came up when I did it and said, man, I've done it. Since I've been a Christian, there's been a time or two that I've taken someone else's rap. Now I'm telling you, it's not an easy thing to do. I, 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 I got blasted by a guy one time over something I didn't do. And the guilty party was in the room, and I was an adult. I'm talking a grown man with a reputation to protect. And he's putting it on me, and the person in the room knew they did it, and they knew that I knew they'd done it. And this guy was laying it on me, and I just sat there and ate every word. It's the hardest thing I ever did. And it kind of opened up in my mind what Christ must have went through when he hung on the cross for all of my sin, taking my rap. See, God changed our ending by changing our heart. Is anybody thankful that he took our shame? We don't have to be ashamed anymore. Come on, why don't you say that out loud? I don't have to be ashamed anymore. I'm accepted in the beloved, in Jesus' mighty name. The second thing I see how he changes our ending is he changes our ending by giving us gifts. Man, the father doesn't just go out and take the shame and accept the son back. He runs out, he weeps, he falls on the son. He says, my son was dead, now my son is alive. My son was lost, and now my son is found. And then he starts breaking out the good stuff. The first thing the Bible says is he puts sandals on the son's feet. And now you would think, well, he gave him a pair of sandals, some Birkenstocks, big deal, what does it matter? Listen, culturally it matters. Because if you were in, in a patriarch's house that was a wealthy man, listen, the servants didn't get shoes. The servants went barefoot but the sons got sandals. You know, you got beautiful feet. God's given you beautiful feet. You're not just a servant anymore. You're a son. Whenever God takes you back, he gives you a sandal. Now, I don't want you to see yourself just as a servant of God. We are servants of God. Somebody say amen to that. But we're more than just servants of God. We are sons and daughters of God most high. We've been adopted. We've been brought in. And so he brings us a sandal and he puts us on our feet, puts it on our feet and says, you don't have to live simply as servants. You can live as sons and daughters. He also went and he put a robe on his back, the giving of gifts. The robe's placed on his back, and it's not just any robe. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about being a fine robe or this nice robe. It's actually a, a high ranking robe. And the only people that would get a robe like this is someone who's in of high authority. Think about it. This son had walked away and lost his place, he gave his place up to somebody else. 
whenever he left and took his inheritance and went to a faraway land. How many of y'all know that there was a guy on the earth that was given a great place by the name of Adam, but the serpent slithered into the garden, and then Adam took our place and he gave it away to somebody else. Whenever he took of the fruit and he ate it, the world fell. Humanity's place has been taken. Our, our seed and our robe was taken from us. The Bible says this, that the heaven of the heavens belongs to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. The earth was given to Adam, and Adam turned around and gave it to the devil whenever he sinned, the authority of the earth. The Bible says this. The Bible says that the devil is now the prince of the power of the air. That's why the stuff that goes on in this world goes on. Some people say, well, if it happened, it must be the will of God, that God's will is always done. I say to you that God's will is seldom ever done on the earth. Why is that? Because we gave our authority over to the devil. Come on, somebody. How many of you know God's will is not always done? If God's will was always done, do you know that every act of, uh, of rape, genocide, incest, uh, pedophilia, that would all be the will of God. But how many know God is against those things? He's a good God. He's a just God. Those things happen because men sinned. See, the will of God is seldom done. See, the authority was given away. And the, the, the young man in the story gave his authority away. But when he came back to the father's house, the father said, listen, I'm going to put this robe back on your back and you're going to be restored to your rightful authority. I don't care what you've done in your past. I don't care what your, your, your past looks like or your story looks like. I'm going to tell you Jesus at the cross has bought back your authority and now you've been clothed in a white robe of righteousness. You are made right with God. Your authority is restored with him. The last thing I see in the giving of gifts, it's another symbol of authority. So he puts a ring on the son's finger. Ring goes on the son's finger. And it's not just any kind of ring, it's a signet ring. It would have a family crest on it. Whenever an official letter was written from a family, you can still get these rings. They're out there and used in different parts of the earth. A lot of times now it's just something that's a symbol of power. So they would take that ring after something was signed and they would push it in wax when it was sealed. And people would know it had the official family crest in the wax that it really came from that family. It also gave that person to buy and to sell, in the, the authority to buy and to sell in the name of the family. He put a ring on his finger. I want you to know that you have a ring on your finger, that you have real authority in what you say. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. You have a ring of authority in your life. He gave us gifts. He gave us authority. The last thing I see that he's done whenever he changes our ending he changes our ending ending literally by changing our bend. Everybody say my bend. Man, this guy, this young man had a bend towards sin. You know, there's a word for a bend towards sin. All of us have a different bend towards sin. All of us uh, in, in our natural state, we're all sinners. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and different people have a different bend towards sin. The Bible word for a bend towards sin is iniquity. Everybody say iniquity. The, the word picture for an iniquity is like a palm tree. If you go to the land of the Bible, there's palm trees everywhere. And uh, those trees will start to lean a certain direction. They lean a certain direction because the wind goes over them. It comes from the south and they begin to lean towards the north or vice versa. And it creates a bend in the tree. And that's the tree's bend. And a lot of us have a bend towards a certain sin. Now, some people say that that sin might be in your, in your nature, it's in your DNA. I don't know, maybe it is. Some will say it's in your nurture, you learn that sin. It doesn't matter, it's still a bend towards a sin. This young man had a bend towards the sin of wanting to live wild, wanting to spend it all now, wanted to blow money, wanted to party. He had that, that spirit to revel on his life. That was his iniquity. I believe whenever he encountered God, his iniquity was changed. He encountered the love of the Father. And what the Father does is he breaks the iniquity off of our life. And some of us, we, have, uh, we, we, we almost make excuses for our sin. They say, well, you know, we blow our top, but come on, Gibsons just blow our tops. We just go crackhead crazy whenever we get mad and get out in the yard and roll around like an episode of Cops. Some of you say stuff like that. Or, you know, we, we drink too much. We're Irish. And sometimes the Irish, they just get drunker than everybody else. And I can't, I can't help myself. They're, they're excusing their iniquity. But you know what the Bible says about each and every one of our bends towards sin? 
The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 5 that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our what, church? He was bruised for my bend towards sin. And now the bend that's been controlling me can't control me anymore because Jesus broke the bend at the cross. And if I believe that, I don't have to give myself to that bend anymore. I can be free from my bend towards sin. I believe this young man encountered the love of the Father and it changed him from an irresponsible son to a son who served in the Father's house. That's what grace really does. I believe this, that no matter what your bend is, God can overcome your bend. If your bend is addiction, that bend is broken. If your bend is anger, that bend is broken. If your bend is jealousy, that bend is broken. If your bend is to fall into poverty, that bend is broken. The bend of sin has been broken once and for all at Calvary's cross, and you can walk in real supernatural freedom. He's changed your ending. The bend doesn't win. Come on, the cross wins. Somebody say amen to that. The bend doesn't get to win. You know why? Because Jesus absolutely changed the ending. There's a, a, a story, a, a great novel written by Charles Dickens. It's called Great Expectation. It is a, it, it's a classic. I mean, if you've taken many, many literary classes or anything like that, you've encountered Dickens' work. Many people are familiar with it. And he wrote Great Expectation. It's an unbelievable uh, novel, been read by people all over the world. Dickens sat down and he penned it, and he wrote it out, and he does what most creative types do before it ever goes out and, and is released. Is you get a few friends, it doesn't matter who you are. If you're a musician, you write a song, you're looking for a couple friends to hear that song before you give it to some people. If you're an author and you write a novel, you, you got some buddies you want to read that novel before you. If you, if you, you it doesn't matter what it is, a painter, you want somebody to look at that, that painting before you release it. And he took a copy of Great Expectations, and he gave it to one of his friends to read. They were living in London at the time. And the friend opened up Great Expectations, and he, he read through chapter 1, and he was enthralled with the book. Dickens is a literary mastermind. It, it captured his friend instantly. And he began to turn the pages from chapter 1 to chapter 2, chapter 3, and he, he couldn't put it down. He read the entire novel in one setting. He read late into the night, and about 1 o'clock in the morning, he got to the ending of Great Expectations. And he read the ending, what happened to the main characters. And the ending was so sad and so morose, he could not believe that Dickens had left the ending where it was. So he picked up the manuscript of Great Expectations. And in the middle of the rain at 1 o'clock in the morning, the legend goes, he marched across London. And he went to Dickens' house. Dickens was asleep in his bedroom. And his friend beat on the door of the house. Dickens didn't answer. And he kept beating on the door of the house. And finally Dickens gets up out of his bed. And he, he comes to the door. And, and he opens the door. And his friend is standing there. And, and his friend looks him in the eye. Walks right past Dickens. Walks to his kitchen table. Slams the manuscript down on the table. And says, change it. And he says, change what? He says, change the ending. And Dickens looked up and he said, you really think I should change the ending that much? He said, yes, you have to change the ending. It is an atrocity. And so Dickens sat down at that point and he wrote an alternate ending to the novel Great Expectations. You could walk to any store, you could buy a copy on the internet, and you can get Great Expectations with two different endings. And I'm going to tell you that your life has a similar story as Great Expectations. There are two different endings that can happen to your life. One is an ending that the world has pinned, the devil has pinned, and sin has pinned. But there is an alternate ending that Jesus Christ of Nazareth has already pinned at Calvary's cross by his blood and by his mercy. And you can have your ending changed by faith in the cross. I think if the Spirit of God was here to speak to you tonight, he would look at your life and he would say, change it. Change the ending. Does not have to be a sad ending. Does not have to be a morose ending. Does not have to be a broken ending. It can be an ending of glee and help and the blessing of God. As a matter of fact, your ending has already been changed. 2,000 years ago at Calvary's cross, if you'll believe it and receive it, the change of God and the blessing of God can come to your life. Would you stand up on your feet and give the God who changes our ending a massive hand clap tonight? Come on, let's really give him a hand clap tonight. We thank you, Lord, that you've changed our ending. 
We thank you, Lord, that the ending's different. I thank you for it. Listen, if you're out there under the sound of my voice right now, you say, Pastor, I'm not right with Jesus. I want to pray for you first. I'm not right with him. I don't know if I were to walk out of here and, and, and not make it home. I don't know if my ending would be heaven. I don't know if my ending would be hell. I don't know where my ending would be. Let me tell you, God didn't design you to die and to go to hell. As a matter of fact, hell was never designed for any man, any woman, any child. The Bible's very clear that hell was designed for the devil and his angels. And God's done something massive to keep humanity out of hell. He's done something to usher humanity into heaven. What did he do to get humanity a doorway into heaven? Well, he came and became the door for us. The Bible says that Jesus was born into this earth, came through the womb of a woman, lived a sinless life where he never messed up, but all of us did. He took our sin upon himself on the cross, and died a sinner's death in our place, took my rap upon himself on the cross, spilled his blood for me and you and the entire world. The Bible teaches if we'll repent of our sins and we'll call on the name of the Lord, we'll be forgiven, we'll be saved, we'll be delivered. You'll have a brand new beginning with God. Would you close your eyes with me for one moment? You'll have a brand new beginning with God. If you're out there and you say, Pastor, I need a new beginning with God. Maybe you never prayed to receive Christ before. Maybe you did years ago, but you've been living your own way. Listen, I'd hate to see your year end without your ending changed. I'd hate to see your year end without your ending changed changed. God of all grace is here. God of all love. God of all mercy. Father standing on the house looking for you. I said come home. Man I'll change you. I'll forgive you. I'll wash you. I'll cleanse you. He's not pointing his finger at you like shame on you. He's saying come unto me. All you who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. If you're out there and you need to rededicate your life or you need to get right with God Whenever I count to three, I want you to lift your hand up right where you are. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to single you out. I'm just going to pray with you. Man, I'm telling you, God's going to do a miracle and forgive you. One, don't put it off. Two, this is your moment. Come on, lift up your hand whenever I count to three. Three, just lift up that hand. Pastor, pray for me. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see you right there. God bless you. Anyone else? I've got one more moment for you. Pastor, pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. I see that hand. God bless you. I see that hand. God bless you. Anyone else, pastor, pray for me. I need that in my life. God bless you. I see you right there. You're in the right place. You're in the, you are in the right place. Here's what we're going to do. Those of you who have lifted your hand up, I saw about five hands. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Give you some words to pray. You're going to supply the meaning. But God's going to do the miracle of forgiving you. We're going to pray out loud. The church is going to pray with you. We're going to connect with God through a prayer. Come on, let's, let, let's pray. Say, say this to the Father. Say, Father, I'm a sinner. I've lived my own way. I've done my own thing. But tonight, I repent. I ask that you would change my ending. Come into my life. Forgive me. Change me. Fill me with your spirit. I boldly declare that Jesus is my Lord. I believe on his death, on his burial, on his resurrection for my salvation. Thank you, Father, for forgiving me. In the name of Jesus, I receive your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap tonight. Listen, those of you that have, have real, you have real financial situations or real family situations that you need a major change in your life. I feel like, I feel like there's an anointing here to get some answer for prayer. I, I, I got a major, I need a major change. Maybe you got a kid that, that's far from God. Maybe you got a financial situation you need turned around. Maybe it's a big health issue. I'm going to tell you, I believe that God's going to change some endings right now. If, that, if that's you and you're out there and you say, Pastor, that's me, I want you to lift a hand to heaven right now and I'm going to pray a blessing over you. I'm going to pray that God would intervene in your situation. Come on, we're going to pray to the God that answers prayer. Now I'm telling you, miracles are going to happen.
happen for you. I'm telling you, answers are going to come. Kids are going to come home. There's kids that are going to get delivered from addiction. That There's things in businesses that are going to be broken. And new, new chapters are going to open up. I'm telling you, the miracle worker, the one that changes things is here. So I want you to reach out, not, not to any preacher. Reach out to him. I want you to lift up the hand of faith right now and get a hold of your miracle. I'm telling you, a miracle's coming into your midst right now. Lord, right now, I pray the prayer of faith for all of my brothers and my sisters. We agree right now together corporately as your church. And I'm praying right now that you would change endings for people. Just like you changed those endings in that story, I declare you're changing the endings in these lives. I say kids are coming home. I say miracle money's being released. I say the wisdom of God is coming. I say depression is going in the name of Jesus. I, I say that bipolar thing that's been owning you, it's coming off of you in Jesus' mighty name. I declare deliverance is here for you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, we believe we receive it in the name of Jesus. Now, come on, just begin to thank God for the answer for one moment. We thank you, Lord. We believe we receive the answer. We believe we got it. We thank you for it by faith. Lord, we say we already got it. It's in our possession. We're not waiting on anything. We say it's ours. The kingdom of God is ours. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I uh, know by the Spirit of God that there's a wife in here, and you've had a husband who served the Lord for a long time, but all of a sudden he just flipped on you, and you don't know what's going on, and you've seen him depart from the faith, and you're seeing him walk off. And the Lord just wants me to say to you tonight I, that it's not time for you to leave yet, but to stay right there and begin to pray and ask him for the miracle and he's going to invade your husband's life there's like an attack on his mind right now and he's flipped on you and you were married to a christian man and it's like it blew your mind and you don't know what to do and you're just freaked out right now and god wants me just to tell you that he needs you to stay put for a minute and begin to believe god and pray over him and so i'm going to pray over you tonight if that's you i just want you to reach out in faith with your heart maybe lift a hand to heaven. I don't want to embarrass you tonight, but I do want you to get your miracle. So I encourage you just to lean in. Father, right now in the name of Jesus as the church, we ask you, God, we stand in faith believing that she receives her answer in the name of Jesus. We say that it won't be long and drawn out, but that her husband will be drawn back into the fold in Jesus' name. That he won't be out on his own. That he won't be outside the flock, but that Jesus, you'll just draw him back in. Shepherd him back in that as she stands there and as she believes and as she lays hands on his pillow and as she lays hands on his steering wheel and as she lays hands on his clothes and as she prays over his laundry and over his plates and over his fork I pray that every single thing that touches him in the next six months is going to be saturated in the anointing and the power of God and that that depression and that thing that's on him that has flipped a switch in his mind and his spirit we say now that it's broken in the name of Jesus. And we say, God, that she's anointed by the Holy Ghost and power to go about doing good and healing those who oppress of the devil. For God is with her. We say today that she is anointed by the Spirit of God to call him back into the kingdom for such a time as this. And Lord, we say that the testimony in and of itself, Lord, would draw thousands into the into the fold of, of Jesus and into the power of God and into the, into the community of God. We say, Lord, that he's a church man. We say that he is a church man in the name of Jesus, not just a Christian, but he is a church man in the name of Jesus. We say that he's strong, that his mind is strong. We say that he prospers. We see that everything that his hand touches, that it succeeds and achieves in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Protect them today. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Let me give a couple words and I'm going to be done. We'll go home. Uh, Josh, I want to prophesy to you for one second. I uh, saw you come in and I commented on that lovely mane and beard you've grown over there. It's a good looking beard, man. And uh, uh, when I looked at you, I saw in the spirit, in the spirit of the Lord, I just saw this word written across your chest. It said, grow. 
And the Spirit of God said, just like Luke chapter 2, verse 52, how Jesus increased wisdom, stature, favor with God and man. God's been growing you, increasing you, giving you a new wisdom. And there's a new way about you. That There's almost a way about you where God's put away some childish things and he's picked up uh, uh, some adulthood and, and becoming a real man. And God says, uh, even as your hair's grown, uh, that there's, there's Samson in the Bible who his power was in his hair. And God says that God's growing your wisdom even as he's grown the hair of your head and that there's coming up some situations in about the next three months of your life where you're going to need wisdom and direction and a godly which way do I go more than you've ever needed it before. But the Spirit of God says that His wisdom has been granted to you and that the wisdom of God, the Spirit of God in Christ, which is your wisdom, is going to stand up inside your heart and He's going to lead you and guide you through rough terrain. I see multiple paths in front of you. Whenever you get to that path, the Spirit of the Lord says He's going to come down, take you by the right hand. He's going to lead you. He's going to say unto you, fear not. And there'll be other people around you that they won't know what to say or what to do. That They'll be driven by every wind, uh, uh, every wave and every wind. But you won't be like that because the Lord will illuminate your path with the wisdom of God. He's been growing you in, in that wisdom for this hour says the Lord of hosts. Now just lift up your hands and receive a new wisdom, a new, a new, a new, a new wisdom. Lord, we thank you for wisdom. We know what to do. The world doesn't know what to do, but I declare we know what to do because you're in us and on us. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Candace, Spirit of God's gonna give you a, a new direction going to have new direction. You're going to have fresh vision. You're going to see some new things, some new paths. God's going to illuminate to you in the, in the very near future. He might already be doing it now, but you just follow the Spirit of God. He's going to lead you into a wide open, spacious thing in your life. It's going to be good. New direction in the name of Jesus. Come on, how many are glad we got to God's house tonight? Anybody thankful? Let's give God one more hand clap tonight. Amen? It's an honor hanging out with you. We love you. Keep your gloves up. Stay out of trouble, amen? All right.